We're here, Senate will be in session this weekend, including Super Bowl Sunday, which is fine by me, um, to deal with this bill that now is, as everyone knows, uh, about Ukraine, funding for Ukraine, and its war effort, uh, funding for Israel, funding for Taiwan, and some other matters. Um, I'm not, I'll dispense with the Israel and Taiwan funding because that's a pretty straightforward one that I think has very strong support here. I'm for it. I'm for both of that. I, I'm also for helping Ukraine uh, against Russia. I do believe we have a national interest in helping Ukraine against Russia. Um, I would just summarize it this way. If you look at China, which most people would agree is a, the world, the U.S.'s biggest adversary at this point for global influence, the Chinese are hoping one of two things is going to happen. The first is they're hoping we're going to get stuck in Ukraine along with what's happening in the Middle East and we're going to be drained by it and we won't be able to focus on the Indo-Pacific. But if we do get engaged, then they hope that, but if we do become disengaged, then they, what their hope is that they'll go around telling people, you see, we told you America is unreliable and uh, power in decline. And so I believe our goal when it comes to Ukraine is to be helpful to Ukraine in a way that doesn't drain us, in a way that doesn't harm our alliances around the world. Um, I have my own personal views on this. I've shared it in the past. I think uh, I, we've had further confirmation of it over the last 24 hours that uh, where I think Ukraine f eventually winds up is I don't believe the Russians can ever achieve their initial objectives no matter what happens, which is to take all of Ukraine and, and, and all the way to Kyiv. I also think it's going to be very difficult for a country the size of Ukraine, no matter how much help it gets, to completely destroy the Russian Federation who, no matter how bad they've been militarily, just have a size advantage. But um, I do believe that at some point, both of these countries are going to try to figure a way out. And the question is, which one of the two is going to have the most leverage and the, most, the best deal possible? And will Ukraine be able to emerge from this as a democracy, as a nation that is not under the thumb of Vladimir Putin and another Belarus, as an example? And so I, I think we have a national interest in the outcome. It's not an unlimited national interest. It doesn't mean we spend how much we, how, however much they need for however long it takes, but there is an interest. So I just wanted to say that at the outset. But I would say that, and, and I say that because obviously I'm informed by my work on the Intelligence Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, my interest in foreign policy, because I think our job here, the federal government, we get involved in a lot of things that are none of our business, but foreign policy and national security is a key part of, of the federal government and what we're supposed to be doing here. And I do believe in the short and long term there are things there, I don't think I need to convince anyone about Israel and Taiwan, that involve the national security of the United States and what the world's going to look like in 5, 10, and 15 years. That said, I would imagine, not that I imagine actually, I know that there are people, if you walked in almost in many places in this country right now and you explained to them what would happen, they would be puzzled. And what people would say, no matter how they may feel about Ukraine, I think for most Americans, frankly, it's not a priority, not because they like Putin and they like Russia, but because we got a lot of problems that people are dealing with in their everyday life. And I think what most people would say is, okay, but if we're going to do that for Ukraine, if we're going to help Ukraine deal with their invasion, shouldn't we first, or at least at the same time, deal with our invasion, with what's happening to our country? So you guys are going to meet all weekend, you're going to fight, you're going to call each other names, you're going to, you know, drag this thing out, you're going to have this big thing that we never do, right? We never stay here on Sundays, which I could, it's fine with me, but we never do all of this. But when we do it, it's always for somebody else or something we, that's not as important as us, but for something that's important to us, something that has to do with America, with our country. It never happens. How, in essence, how can you be helping Ukraine with their invasion but not be helping America with its invasion? And it is an invasion, what's happening in our southern border. These are very conservative numbers, but they're incredibly accurate. They come right from both public and non-public, not classified, but non-public information, the products that have been produced from the House Committee, for example. So let, let's just say from January 20th of 2021, okay, 3.3 million people have entered the United States illegally and been released into the country. Of those 3.3 million people that have entered the country illegally, 99.7% of them are still here. They have not been deported or removed. And of the 3.3 million that have been released into this country, over 617,000 of them, and these are old numbers, these are numbers from last month, of the 3.3 million people that entered the country illegally and were released, 617,000 of them either have criminal convictions or pending criminal charges. 
So we have at least 600,000 convicted criminals, suspected criminals, entered the country illegally, free to roam the country now. So people ask, well, how did this happen? Because it's never been zero. Let's be clear. It's never been zero. There's never been zero illegal people getting into America. But how did this happen? Well, let's first start with our law. Because when you, people talk about immigration around here, they pretend like, well, immigration is completely unregulated. We need new laws to fix it because the laws are, are all messed up and we don't regulate. No, the law, immigration laws in America can be summarized. I mean, it's a complex area of law, but at its core, quite simple. Here's what immigration law in America is. It says this. These are the people that are allowed to be in the United States of America. And if someone who is not allowed to be in the United States of America enters illegally, you are to detain them through removal. Meaning you are to detain them in immigration detention until their case is either resolved or they are removed from the country. That is the law of the United States. And that's been the law of the United States for quite some time. Now, with that detention requirement that you hold them until they're removed, We've always had exceptions, narrow exceptions. So for example, the Dalai Lama shows up at the border of the United States and says, hey, I'm here because the Chinese are trying to kill me. Exception, right? There have always been exceptions. These are supposed to be narrow exceptions, and they're supposed to apply to individual case by case, humanitarian, things of this nature. But for the first time in American history, the current president of the United States decided to make the exception the rule. The rule. It became the rule that if you arrived here, we would not detain. Except the exception became those we were detaining. I just gave you the numbers of the people who were released. So the exceptions ate up the rule. And that's how this happens. And why it happens, it's not hard to understand. I assure you guys, listen, I live in an immigrant community. When it comes to immigration, you know, I've been in the game for 10 years making these things, you know, looking at these things that are longer. I live it. Like, I live it. Like, where I, my entire, my, my entire family are immigrants. My wife's entire family are immigrants. All of my neighbors are immigrants. I can't drive two blocks and go anywhere and not be, I live in Miami, Florida, surrounded in a community of immigrants from all over the hemisphere and all over the world. So when I talk to you about these things, that I didn't read about it in a magazine, I didn't see some documentary, I didn't have some briefing, I talk to people who show me, they've shown me, they said, listen, this, this is the, the cash app payment that I sent to some guy to bring my sister and her husband. Here's the Venmo that I sent to some guy to help my family get from Nicaragua, from Cuba to Nicaragua, and Nicaragua to the United States. And they don't know what the immigration law is, they don't know about exceptions, aside, they don't know, well, here's what they know. They know that they know people that have come here, turned themselves in, said, I'm here, blah, 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 and they were released. They know people that did it, and those people tell other people, and the traffickers advertise it. And so what happens is that when people figure out, and they figure it out pretty quickly, human beings are incentive-based creatures. All of us are. That's why we pass laws to punish crime. That's why we raise taxes on cigarettes, because we want people to smoke less. And we're incentive-based creatures, and when people know that you can get, that if you can make it inside of the United States and turn yourself in, your chances of being released are, you know, 85, 90 something percent. More people are gonna come. The numbers don't lie. I don't have it with me. I tried to blow it up, I couldn't have, couldn't print it on time. But there's a graph that shows, it looks like one of those things, you know, those echocardiograms, except this one goes straight up. It basically says, here's the number in December of 2019, January of 2020, February of 2021, and it just spikes right up. Why did it spike? It spiked because we told people, by the way, if you're a single adult, which was the biggest driver that really changed everything, if you're a single adult and you come into America illegally and you turn yourself in, we will, we will interview you, maybe not even interview you, and we will release you into the country. People figure it out. And the way you solve it is to reverse that. The law didn't change. The immigration law today looks the same as it did in 2019. No immigration law has changed in America. What changed is this policy by executive order. Remember, we pass laws, it has to be executed. Okay, so look what's happening with crime. It is illegal in every jurisdiction in America to shoplift. 
But the places where you see a spike in shoplifting is the places where the prosecutors have decided we're not going to prosecute those cases. And when you tell people, yes, it's illegal to do something, but we're not going to prosecute it, we're not going to go after it, you're going to get it. So how do you solve this? You solve it the same way you created it, by reversing what we created it. That's how you solve it. And so a lot of us said, well, look, if we're going to do all this for Ukraine and all these other countries, but we're, Ukraine was really the, and this is something you really want, it's important, can't we also, so that we look at least half sane to the people in this country that can't understand how we could spend all this time and energy not helping ourselves before we help other countries, can we at least deal with the border? So they said, okay, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do something on the border. And they spent three, four, I don't know, eight weeks, whatever, uh, negotiating a, a deal. And then they produced it. I didn't have anything to do with that deal. I'm not condemning the people that did it. I've done immigration uh, negotiations in the past. It's difficult. This is even more difficult because it's in the midst of a mass migration crisis. But they negotiated a deal, but I didn't negotiate it. I didn't even know what was in it until Sunday. And I read it. I read it twice, actually went through it with the knowledge base that I have, but it was, they negotiated a deal that most of us, for the most part, to be fair, had nothing to do with negotiating. And I realized pretty quickly, this is not going to reverse. I know you can call it whatever you want, call it border security, you can label it anything you want, but this is not gonna solve our problem. And immediately you say, oh, the Republicans are, are a bunch of lies. The first is these Republicans, they, they wanted a border deal, we gave them a border deal, and now they want to tank the whole thing. They've changed their minds. I think that was the president. We gave them the exact deal that they asked for, and they changed their mind. You didn't give me the exact deal I asked for. I asked for measures, steps, that would actually solve the migration crisis. This bill doesn't do that. In fact, I never even asked for a bill. I'm not against some of the language that's in there. You want to change the standard on, on asylum? Long overdue. But that alone is not going to stop the migration crisis. That's what I asked for. I didn't negotiate it. I didn't even know what was in it, like I told you, until Sunday. And so the solution that I want to see and did want to see and continue to want to see, the solution that we could actually go back to people and say, guys, we did something real on the border. Yes, we're going to help Ukraine with their invasion, but we actually did something real is also going to happen with our invasion. That was not this bill, despite whatever people may say about it. You know, we rejected the, the toughest border deal imaginable, is the other thing that people said. You know, like if somehow this, you know, they, they figured out a way, you know, they sprinkled holy water upon a vampire with this thing. Look, I could spell out a bunch of problems in this bill. I don't have time. I'm not going to spend the time going through every detail. You know, this emergency thing they brag about, emergency power to shut down the border. They don't tell you it's limited to 270 days, and the president can suspend it at any time. All the president has to say is, it's not in our national interest. We need to suspend the emergency. Um, by the way, even in the emergency, you still have to process 1,400 people a day, illegal immigrants a day, even in the midst of an emergency. But, but let me focus on what I think is what I believe to be the most blatant trap that was put in place in this bill. And it's one that people don't necessarily spot right away if you don't understand immigration law and how it's been applied over the last decade. So there's this thing in the bill. Remember, one of the things that people use about immigration is asylum. It takes too long. It takes eight to 10 years, huge backlogs, courts, the like. It's true. And it's one of the incentives, by the way, because people know if you release me pending a hearing 10 years from now, 10 years from now, you won't even know where I am, much less show up at a hearing. But so they come back and say, oh, we're prepared to solve that. How do they solve it? Well, they create what I call the Asylum Corps. In essence, they're going to go out and they're going to hire thousands of Department of Homeland Security agents, bureaucrats, agent employees, not judges, to process these claims, potentially right at the border. Right? So right at the border, these agents will be able to interact with an illegal immigrant, interview them, ask them some questions, and they will have the power, they will have the power right there at the border to do three things. The first is they could say, no, you don't qualify, you're out of here, or we're going to detain you and you're out of here. They could do that. That's not been the history of what's happening now. 
And let me just tell you, from what I know, most of the people that sign up for these jobs and this duty do not sign up to kick people out. They sign up to help people get in. But that's the asylum corps. That's the first power. The other two things are the likeliest ones. The first is, we think you might have a claim. We're going to release you pending a hearing before a judge, and you get an immediate work permit. Right now, you got to wait six months for a work permit, even if you're released like these people are. An immediate work permit. You want to talk about a migration magnet? When people figure out, if I get there, I have an X percent chance of being given an immediate work permit. That's a migration magnet. But here's the third thing they can do. They can give you asylum. Right there and then. Not a judge. A member of this new asylum corps can literally give you asylum right there and then. Now, let me be fair. The law says they can do it under the Convention Against Torture, which is an international treaty. Well, what is that? Well, let me tell you how that's been applied. How it's been applied is that the Convention Against Torture isn't just like we're going to send you back somewhere where they're going to waterboard you. The Convention Against Torture has been applied, and most of the activist groups would argue, means we cannot remove people from this country. If we're going to send them back to a place where they might be kidnapped or where they might be assaulted, not by just the government, but by non-government criminal gangs. So basically, if you come from a country where gangs kidnap people, where gangs kill people, where gangs extort people, where gangs threaten people, where gangs assault people. If you come from a country where that happens, we cannot send you back there under the Convention of Torture. That's their interpretation of it. My friends, that's like 100 countries on Earth. That's like almost every country represented in the number of people that arrive at the border. So basically, what you will have is an asylum corps with the power to grant people asylum right at the border. And let me tell you the difference between the asylum court and an immigration judge. If an immigration judge makes that decision, the attorney general can still step in and reverse it. These are irreversible decisions. And let me tell you what asylum means. Asylum is basically a green card. You are now five years away from being a US citizen. That number is not going to be zero. If that law and that provision had been in place today, some of these 3 point something million people, 3.3 million people, would have already been a year or two into their five-year wait to become citizens and voters of the United States of America. That's in that bill. And that's what it means when you read past the language and the shalls and the this and that and all that. That's what that language means. And you want me to vote for a bill so that a year or two from now, when the news reports come out, that the Asylum Corps has granted asylum and a five-year path to citizenship to 500,000 people. And I'm, oh, I would have everybody here would say, well, I didn't know that was in the law. That's in the law. That's in that bill. That's there. And I could go on. There are other things. The point is, this was a trap. It was put in there in place. That was the goal. This is not a border. That would actually incentivize immigration, knowing what it is that incentivizes people to come. The other lie is, well, without a law, we can't do anything about the border. I already explained to, to you how we got here in this first place. We stopped detaining everybody. Remember, a few years ago it was, you know, again, let's go back and be clear. The children that were being detained was because we had to, before we turned them over to some guy who claimed to be their uncle, we had to make sure he wasn't Jeffrey Dahmer. We had to make sure he wasn't some pedophile. We had to make sure it was really their uncle. And in the meantime, you got to put him somewhere. But that was inhumane. That, but now it's spread. Now it's the detention of anybody is inhumane. You've got people out there saying, by the way, we shouldn't even put ankle bracelets on people that are released. That's inhumane. But the, the incentive that drove the immigration was we stopped detaining single adults. And the word got out really fast. And the traffickers, this is a business for them. They traffic people. They move people. They, they move drugs. They move contraband. And they move people. And they knew this. And they sell it. They advertise it. I wish I would have brought some of the, the pamphlets that they hand out or pictures of some of the things they put up on social media in these countries advertising the service. You, were, you don't need a law to fix that because the law hasn't changed. What you need is to reverse the executive orders, the decisions of the administration. And the president can do that. In fact, 
I, I heard yesterday, I think it was NBC News or something, reported the president is now considering executive actions on the border. So at least they've acknowledged that they have that power. A reporter asked me yesterday, well, you guys are always against executive actions. Well, the executive actions I think they need to take is to reverse executive actions that he's taken, which created this crisis. And there's other things we can do that he can do. He can return, he can do the return to Mexico. He can do the safe third country. By the way, the safe third country one is an interesting one. I was kind of involved in when that was put in place. And initially, because it's counterintuitive, initially a lot of people said, why would these countries agree to that? So let me tell you why Honduras would agree to it, why El Salvador agreed to it. Let me tell you why. Because those are transit countries. And safe third country basically said, if you come through that country, once you step foot in that country, you are automatically disqualified from getting asylum in the United States. Now, I have nothing against these countries, but I promise you that the migrants that are going through El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala were going through. They, weren't, they didn't go to Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, or Nicaragua, for that matter, to stay there. They went there because it was on the way to where they were trying to go. The minute migrants realized, if I go there, if I go to Honduras, I automatically cannot get into the United States. They stopped going to Honduras or they stopped going to El Salvador. The countries figured it out. I bet you we could get a, many more countries to sign up to something like that. Because they are bearing the brunt of being in the middle of the migration corridor. We could return to that as well. And yes, we could build barriers. You know, I remember after the events, of, horrible events of January 6th here in the Capitol, the first thing that went up around this entire building was a fence with barbed wire and National Guard. First thing they did, to protect the Capitol and themselves is put up deputized National Guard from all over America and put up a bunch of fences around the Capitol. Some of the biggest fences you've ever seen, and it went up like that. But somehow, when our country's being invaded and you put up a fence and you send the National Guard, this administration will go to the Supreme Court and try to stop you. So they'll do it to protect themselves, but they won't do it to protect America. My friends, the truth is Biden doesn't want to stop the border crisis. And the reason why is politics. I know his, I know his memory is probably not the best, but I remember that he spent three years repeatedly saying, not just him, all the deputies, people in this chamber, all these you know, know-it-alls on television, there is no crisis at the border. This is not a crisis. It's being exaggerated. Exaggerated by a bunch of xenophobes and racists. But now it's a top issue in the country to voters. It wasn't a crisis until it became a crisis in New York and Chicago and all these major cities around the country who now suddenly, you know, when it was happening to Texas, when this was happening in the border in Arizona, as if somehow all the people that came here were 3.3 million people were all going to stay in Eagle Pass, Texas. But once it got into their cities, once it started impacting them, now it became a problem too. Once you had to start closing schools because you needed to make it a migrant shelter, now it was a crisis. Now when you got a gang of pickpocketers running through New York, assaulting police officers, now it's a crisis. Now when the residents of your own city are screaming at you, why are you spending all this money when we have our own homeless problem, now you have a crisis. And, and voters were saying it too. And so I imagine, I'm certain, that the people involved in the Biden re-election effort came to him and said, sir, we, we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan. And the plan needs to be something that at least looks like we're trying to stop it, but doesn't upset that element of our base who actually believes that anyone who comes here should be allowed to come in. And that element exists. That element exists. There are people in American politics and in American political discourse who believe that if you make it across the border, virtually anyone who comes here, unless, you know, like the worst possible human being, if you make it across the border, you should be allowed to stay even if you came illegally. So they had to come up with a plan. So what was the plan? Here was the plan. And I called this out in December. The plan is, let's do a border deal. Let's call it a border deal. And, but let's make sure it doesn't stop migration, because I don't, we don't want to upset our base, but let's also make sure that it's bipartisan. Let's get some Republicans to sign on to it, and then let's get it passed through the Senate, and then when the House kills it, we can say, I, Joe Biden, tried to fix the border, 
but these Neanderthals, MAGA House members, they killed it. So blame them from now on. In fact, I'm not speculating here. There's nothing I'm, I'm just like psychically coming up with. There's an article in Politico in which an unnamed source in the Biden campaign was basically saying, yeah, this is perfect. If they pass it, he can claim credit for a bipartisan deal and tell people now just be patient. It's going to take time to work, but it's bipartisan. If it doesn't pass, he can blame the Republicans and say they own it. And those talking points were already being said, including by some of my colleagues here on some Sunday shows I saw. They were already saying that even before the deal was already out there. That was the plan. But he'll never fix it. One, because there are people in the base that, that don't want it to be fixed. They believe there are people in American politics, as I said already, that think anyone who comes here should be allowed to come and stay. There are others, frankly, who see a bunch of voters. They see a bunch of future voters. You know what? Let's find a way to get people asylum. Asylum is perfect. It puts them instantly on the path to citizenship. And four, six years from now, we're going to have a bunch of new voters, and they'll vote for us, and they'll remember we're the ones that let them in. So that's another element of it. But I want to go back to the one about the elements of their base that believe in open borders, whether they admit it or not. And some of them actually do admit it. Okay, there are actually people that have told me to my face, people should be allowed to live in any country that they want. Which I suppose in a free society you can have a right to any opinion you want. I assure you it's not a majority position in America. In fact, I assure you it's a majority, not a majority position in any country. But somehow they think it should be our position. And if you don't think that the elements of a base have influence over our politics, I submit to you what's happening right now with Israel policy. So we've already seen, I would imagine, a small minority, but nonetheless, a minority of, of radical, anti-Semitic, pro-Hamas activists who are out there basically saying we're, they're threatening to vote against Joe Biden. They've said it. We will vote. Do not count on our vote. We're going to vote against you. Your name is Genocide Joe, they call him. They disrupt his speeches. He tried to give a speech the other day. I think there was like 40 interruptions. They've been in the hallways here. You know, it's not just the weirdos from this code pink communist group, but it's others screaming at us. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that. You know, all the stuff that's out there. Um, but he has it. So I came to so you have a problem. We have an element of our base in some states that say they're not going to vote for you because you're helping Israel too much. And that's where you see the leak. The first leak that came out is, oh, the president hung up on Netanyahu. Then you see another leak a couple weeks ago. We're going to have a two-state solution. Never mind the fact that the two most prominent Palestinian groups, sadly, in the region are groups. One of them is going to wind up the government of that second state. And these are groups that do things like give cash rewards for killing Jews. The more Jews you kill, the more money your family gets if you're a martyr. Pay to slay, it's real. Groups that, for example, in their schools, when their kids are four, five, six years of age, their school books, their textbooks, teach them. Jews are subhuman and they're evil. Groups that are not interested in a two-state solution. These groups are calling for a one-state solution. From the river to the sea, no Jews, only them. So let's give them their own country. Now, I would love for that to be possible, but not as long as those people are around. But that's the other thing they threw out there. And then yesterday, we read that the White House has set emissaries, top aides from the White House, went to Michigan to meet with some of these upset activists to see if we could somehow I mean, make them, bring them along so they'll vote for him in November and you know, stop being mean to Joe Biden over Israel. Well, you know who some of these people were? M multiple. More than one of them were people that have openly, openly been supportive of both Hamas and Hezbollah. Call them freedom fighters. At least one of them is a guy who has publicly said on multiple occasions that the U.S. government is controlled by Zionist money, by Jewish money. That's who the White House went to meet with yesterday. And then last night, we're treated to a press conference by the President of the United States. And what I imagine was an unscripted moment, maybe not, 
He says Israel's response to Hamas has been over the top. Which is ironic, because I support Israel funding, but here we are today being asked to pass a bill that has all this money for Israel, which I support. So what are we funding? We're funding Israel's over-the-top campaign against Hamas? So you, it doesn't make any sense except the politics. That's how politics influences all this. I, I, you know, I would conclude by just taking us back to the original point, which is the reason why I've voted already to move to proceeds is I just don't, I don't know how you go to people in everyday life, hardworking people, and you say to them, people that are upset because they feel like our country's border is being overrun, and it is. And they say, how come we're not doing anything about that? Something real, like why aren't we making that a priority? Why don't we ever read that the Senate is staying in through the weekend arguing and fighting and working on something real to stop the border. How come that never gets a priority? The growing number of Americans that always feel like when it comes to a major issue and a major fight, they're always second, behind another country, behind another group, behind somebody else, who have been, for the better part of 20 years, told, we have to take care of others before we focus on your problems. Let's send our jobs and our factories to other countries, because it's good for the global economy. Let's spend, I know we have homeless veterans living, you know, committing record amounts of suicides and these tragedies, but let's spend more money housing migrants in this country illegally to begin with. People who watched the news last week, okay? A roving gang of migrants from Venezuela. I mean, it's interesting because for a year now, the Venezuelan community in South Florida has been telling me to be careful because some of the people that are coming from Venezuela now are clearly gang bangers. And, you know, I, you have to prove that. Like, how do, I'm, I'm not saying it's zero percent, but they were right. They warned me a year ago. Now we're seeing it. And you saw it last week when, what, five or seven of them assaulted a police officers, were arrested, were released within an hour without any bail, flipped the middle finger to America, and walked right out, back to the migrant shelter, paid for by taxpayers. You saw it last Sunday, where an illegal migrant of Palestinian descent went to Nassau County in New York, walked into some guy's house, tore down his Israel and American flags. When the guy confronted him, he assaulted the guy and started screaming things about, like, hey, we're going to kill all the Jews. Those are just two examples. I could give you more, but they're there. People are watching this stuff, and they're angry. But I said, why don't you guys do something about that? Why aren't you staying through the weekend about that? Why aren't those people being deported immediately? How about these people here on student visas? You're a visitor to the United States of America on a student visa, on a student visa or whatever visa, and you're in the street calling for intifada, but we can't deport you. They won't deport you. We know who you are. You're not here illegally. You're here on a visa. If you had said all that stuff, we probably wouldn't have given you the visa. But now that you're here, you get to keep the visa? Deport those people. They won't. Why aren't you fighting about that? Most Americans have nothing against Ukraine. Most Americans want to help Ukraine. But I don't think it's unreasonable for them to say, but what about us? What about our country? What about our invasion? What about our border? And I want to say this with as much respect as I can. There's nobody in the Senate that can lecture me on immigration. This is not, not a political issue. I've lived it my whole life. This is not immigration. 3.3 million people released into the country, 5 to 10,000 people a day illegally arriving in the country. That's not immigration. Immigration is a good thing. Mass migration is a bad thing. And that's what this is. This is a mass migration, and it's not good for anyone. It's not even good for the migrants, many of whom are raped and killed along the way. It's good for the traffickers. It's good for the enemies of this country. But it's not good for the migrants. This is mass migration. And it reminds me, people say, well, if you're against this and you want to be strict about immigration, that's anti-immigrant, which is silly, at least if they say it to me. But I remember, like, I'm not anti-rain. 
think rain is a good thing. I think we need rain, right? I'm anti-flood. I'm not against the rain, I'm against flooding. Does being against flooding make you anti-rain? No. And being against mass migration does not make you anti-immigration. Because mass migration is not immigration. And beyond the issues of sovereignty and common sense and the costs involved, beyond all of that, do we really think that you can release 600,000 people with either criminal convictions or pending criminal charges into the country and nothing's going to happen? You think these people, you think you can release 600,000 people with criminal histories and they're all of a sudden all going to become entrepreneurs and start some tech company? No. The chances are that a lot of them are going to continue to be criminals. You're going to have a crime wave. It's already starting. And no part of this country will be immune from it. And you think ISIS, and for that matter, every terrorist organization in the world, no matter what sewer they live in or some cave they're hiding in, you don't think they're aware that the largest, most effective human smuggling operation in all of human history is operating right on the border of the United States? You don't think they're aware of it? Because the guys that were involved in 9-11, those animals, savages, they actually came here on a visa pretending to be flight students. The next 9-11, God forbid, they don't have to pretend anything. All they have to say is, I come from a country where people are kidnapped and where people are often victims of crime, and you must let me in. And for all we know, some of them may actually become citizens because they're going to get asylum. You don't think that these terrorist groups are aware. I don't even have to, I can't, and I won't divulge any intelligence information, so let's just use common sense. Common sense tells you that these groups and these terrorist organizations understand that the largest human smuggling, migrant smuggling operation in the history of mankind operates right at the border of the United States. And we don't think anything's going to come out as a result of it. Something bad's going to happen. Something bad, really bad, is bound to happen. And when it does, remember this day. Because when it does, when something really bad happens, when we are overrun by a horrible crime wave in multiple cities, guys, we lived it. I was a child. I actually didn't even live in Miami at the time. We had moved away for a few years. The Mario Boatlift brought 200,000, less than 200,000 people from Cuba all at once. It took Miami 10 years to dig out of that. Bill Clinton lost his re-election because he agreed to take in some of those people into a federal facility in Arkansas, and they set it on fire. And there were a lot of people that came in Mariel who did fine. And there were a bunch of criminals and sadists and lunatics as well. Because you take a lot of people from anywhere, and you're going to have the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, we have something just like this happening not once over a span of weeks, Literally every month we have two Mariels. And you think that you're going to allow a flood of people into America and something bad's not going to happen? Sadly, it is. It's just a matter of time. And when it does, when it does, things that may sound extreme now to some aren't just going to sound reasonable, they're going to sound overdue. And you know what they're going to ask us? How could you have allowed this to happen? And so I end where I began. I know that if all you do is spend your time here and watch those networks and you know, read these columnists and newspapers, you may lose this perspective. But I promise you, in the real world, on planet Earth, in this country, among everyday people, most of them are asking themselves, you want to help Ukraine? We're for it. You want to help Israel? Of course. Yes, we should help Taiwan. But who's helping America? Why isn't helping our country deal with this migrant crisis number one before those other things? Don't they tell you on an airplane, if the, if the, uh, the oxygen mask deploy, put on your mask and then put the one on your kid? What good are we? Well, how, you, well, how useful is America to anyone in the world, to any country on this planet, if we're falling apart inside? And then who do we work for? 
We work for Americans. I am a United States citizen, I, a United States senator. I care about the things that are going on in the world. No one's ever accused me of being an isolationist, and those things do matter to America. But you have to start with the fundamentals. And as you have to be strong at home in order to be able to be strong for our allies. We are being invaded. Every single day, today, eight to 10,000 people will enter the United States illegally and unlawfully. We don't know who most of them are. Don't let them tell you that they do. You can buy a fake passport. You can buy fake travel documents in Brazil. In multiple countries in Latin America, you can buy them. It's an industry. And so I'm just telling you, we are going to have something bad happen, and people are going to ask, why didn't you guys fight over that? Why didn't you stay over the weekend about that? And so why are we focused on an invasion of another country, which is important, but not focused on the invasion of our own country? And it can be solved. The president's executive orders created it, and he can reverse it but he won't, so here we are.